So good morning, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to uh, our Enabling Aging in Place informational webinar. Uh, so this webinar will introduce Healthcare Excellence Canada's new collaborative. Um, and my name is Tanya McDonald, Director of Strategic Initiatives and Programs at Healthcare Excellence Canada, and I am pleased to be your webinar uh, host for today. So before we get started uh, with the actual webinar, I just have a few um, messages to share uh, with everyone who's listening in today. So we are pleased to offer French simultaneous interpretation for this session. If you wish to hear the voice of the interpreter, please select French from the interpretation menu at the bottom of your screen. If you need support at any time during this webinar, you can reach out to tech support using the chat feature. Um, and we also invite you to share your questions and comments at any point in our chat box in either English or French. We will aim to answer as many questions as possible during our Q&A session at the end of the webinar. Um, but we recognize that we may not get to all of your questions, so we will commit to answering all of your questions and following up with an email um, after the webinar session. And also just a reminder that this session is being recorded and a link to the recording will be available next week for you to review and share with your colleagues who may have missed this session. So before I introduce the speakers, I acknowledge that um, we are meeting here today on the unceded, unsurrendered territory of the Algonquin people um, and that I am hosting this webinar from Ottawa. Um, I am very grateful to live on this land close to the Ottawa River and near the beautiful paths and I really enjoy uh, being this close to nature um, and commit to um, engaging with Indigenous authors and um, different documentaries as part of my truth and reconciliation journey to learning more about the Indigenous people of Canada and their connection to the lands and the history here. And so now it is my pleasure uh, to introduce our speakers for today's session. Uh, so Andrea Pichet is Senior Program Lead on the Strategic Initiatives and Programs here at HEC, and she will be uh, leading the webinar session today. We are also pleased to have Jennifer Lalonde, Executive Director of Ottawa West Community Support, uh, with us today to discuss the Ottawa West Aging in Place Program and the work the program does to support aging in place in the community. And we also have Ricardo Angelis, who is a research associate and assistant professor at McMaster University, who is participating in today's session on behalf of the CPAT clinic team and is representing Dr. Gina Agarwal, who is unable to attend our session today. So over to you, Andrea, to start us off. Thank you, Tanya. Good morning, everyone. Oh, is the, uh, I'd just like to confirm uh, that my video and audio are showing excellent, wonderful. Um, so welcome, I'm very excited to be introducing our Enabling in Place Collaborative. Um, for those of you joining us this morning, what you're gonna hear is specifically what the opportunity is uh, in AGC's new collaborative. We'll tell you a little bit about who should be applying and who's appropriate for this, uh, this partnership. Um, what the benefits are of participating in our program, uh, as well as how you can apply. Um, next slide. So just a little bit of context uh, in terms of why HEC is supporting Aging in Place and why this is important to us. Uh, as an organization, we are focused on ensuring that everyone living in Canada has safe and high quality access to health care. And we've been listening to the priorities of many stakeholders across the country and what we're hearing is that care of older adults, both in terms of their health needs and their social needs are important. Um, and what we know is that most Canadians and people in Canada want to age where they call home in the community for as long as they can. But what we also know is that there's not enough capacity to meet the growing demand uh, for those who need long-term care. And we also know that about one in 10 people who enter long-term care could have been cared for at home if they had formal support. And when we did some, some digging into the drivers, why is this the case? You know, we learned that there are a lot of challenges with health system navigation. We've learned that there's a lot of financial barriers. 
Um, there's issues with respect to responsiveness and the types of services and how they're being delivered. And just in general with people being able to access specialized services. We also know from this work, but also work across many HEC programs that Northern rural tend to have fewer form of supports uh, available to them, particularly you know, to support older adults living in community compared to their urban counterparts. Um, and we also know that supporting older adults to age in place is a priority at the federal, at the provincial territorial, and at the municipal levels. Um, so with all of this in mind, um, we have formulated and make strides in this area. Next slide. So, and we can advance one more. So the goal of the collaborative is to bring together health and social organizations from across the healthcare continuum, including community organizations, to support the health and social needs of older adults and care partners living in the community. And we're particularly interested in supporting organizations that are serving older adults with complex health needs and who are more vulnerable to social and structural determinants of health. Next slide. So the benefits of our program are shown on the screen. And what I'm gonna do is walk you through how these benefits are offered throughout the course of the program. So the program is gonna be implemented in two phases. In phase one, 25 participating teams will receive up to $15,000 to support their program planning efforts. They'll be supported to create an implementation plan and an evaluation plan during this phase. In phase two, participating teams will receive up to $25,000 to support their implementation efforts. In both phases, Participating organizations will have an opportunity to learn with and from a community of practice alongside the other participating teams. And ATC will support this by providing a variety of networking. Additionally, throughout this program, teams will be supported to use an asset-based community development approach to their program design and implementation activities, as well as other frameworks to help promote equity, diversity, and inclusion support trauma resilience in their program staff and embed continuous quality improvement tools into their program structures. A key component to a successful aging in place program is measurement and evaluation. The HEC will support teams in planning for these activities during both phases. Finally, the Enabling in Place Collaborative aims to develop knowledge translation tools that will help future aging in place programs implement successfully and sustainability. Through the experiences shared in this program, participating teams will be contributing to the development of these new resources. Next slide. So for those of you who are interested in participating, we have four key enrollment criteria. So the first is, is that you, as an applicant team, you need to be developing, spreading, or expanding an aging in place program that prioritizes older adults living in the community who have complex medical needs and are more heavily impacted by structural and social determinants of health. You need to have a team that's capable of supporting the development and implementation of the program. You need to have resources to conduct the planning and implementation activities over the next two years. And the program needs to align with HEC's Enabling Aging in Place program principles. Next slide. So our Enabling Aging in Place program principles were developed based on a combination of our program objectives and success enabling factors that we identified from across a wide range of innovative promising practices that have already been implemented across the health and social care continuum to support aging in place. So if we start at the top three boxes that are horizontal across the screen, you'll see that these principles relate to um, the categories of services that programs are delivering to older adults and care partners. So the first one on the left is access to specialized healthcare services. So these are services that will help to promote all forms of health for older adults and will be aligned to the needs, resources, and priorities of each community and the program's unique capabilities. The second is access to social and community support. And these services help to improve social connections and reduce loneliness and social isolation. Finally, the third is access to system navigation and support. 
And these services provide a personalized approach to system navigation, accompanying older adults and care partners on their journey at the level that's wanted and needed. Program principles are related to how services are provided. And so services, according to our program principles, must be provided in a way that is adaptive and responsive to the individual needs of each older adult and care partner. And they need to adapt and respond to their emerging needs as they evolve. Services must also promote a health equity lens with a focus on structural and social determinants of health. And finally, services must deliver high value by optimizing resources used on health and social services in ways that relate to outcomes that matter to older adults and caregivers. Next slide. So through our collaborative, we aim to help teams improve in the following specific areas. Delayed entry to long-term care, Reduction in unnecessary ED visits, improvement of quality of life, including decreased social isolation, improvement in health and social service access and utilization, improvement in staff ability to make improvements in how they do their job, and decreased care partner burden. HEC is developing an evaluation framework to guide the collection of this data at the individual program level. And we'll work with teams to identify which metrics can be captured by each participating program, as well as to capture additional metrics that are identified as important to individual teams. Next slide. So as I mentioned earlier, the program is being offered in two phases. Once the call for applications closes on November the 15th, applications will be reviewed and assessed by a merit review panel of experts. All of our applicant teams will be notified of the outcome of the application process. Phase one of the program will run from January until April of 2024. And during this time, teams will develop their implementation and evaluation plans while developing relationships across the community of practice. During this time, we'll also offer public webinars to showcase a number of promising practices that are supporting aging in place across Canada. Phase two of the program will formally begin in June 2024. And during this phase, teams will receive coaching and other support to implement their programs. Next slide. So if you're wondering if your organization is the right one to apply, on the list uh, on the screen, you'll see the organization types that we are looking forward to receiving applications from. However, if your organization type isn't reflected on this list and you're interested in applying, please reach out to us by email. Um, you'll see our email address for the program on the last slide of the webinar deck, and we'd be happy to discuss your potential eligibility. In terms of, next slide, in terms of selection considerations, we're looking for strong applications that align with our eligibility criteria, uh, also with our program principles. Um, and we're aiming to select a cohort of 25 sites with diversity in geographical representation, in community and cultural representation, um, including First Nation, Inuit, and Métis organizations, um, and people who are at different stages of their improvement journey. Additionally, we're looking for opportunities to help teams where there's greater community need. Our team composition is representative of the cultural makeup of that community. Uh, we're also committed to collaborate uh, to supporting teams that will collaborate with diverse local stakeholders. Next slide. So in terms of what teams are committing to, um, it's expected that teams applying to the program will participate in both phase one and phase two, and that they're willing to do the following work over the course of both phases. So at first, we want everyone to prepare an implementation and evaluation plan based on templates that HEC is preparing. Uh, second expectation is that teams will implement, spread, or expand their program beginning no later than June 2024 with the ability to share impact data by September 2025. Third, we want teams who are willing to develop a sustainability plan to increase the likelihood of the future success of their program. 
And fourth, we want teams to attend and contribute to the in-person virtual uh, events aimed at building a community of practice, developing program team capabilities, and developing national resources to support the ongoing growth of aging in place programs in Canada. Next slide. As we embark on our aging in place journey, we wanna spotlight high impact work from across the country that aligns with our program principles to inspire more communities to develop aging in place programs. We've started by creating a case study series that's published on our website, and we're gonna to continue to add to this as we learn about more promising practices. The programs that are listed here on this slide are some of the first case studies that we'll be featuring. And today we have two guests with us that are gonna share a little bit about their programs in a, in a sort of conversational format. Our first guest is Jennifer Lalonde from the Ottawa West Aging in Place program. So if you could advance to the next slide, and Jennifer, I welcome you to turn on your camera. Thanks, Andrea. Can you hear me? I hear you well. Thanks for being with us. I appreciate your time today. Very excited to uh, to introduce this program to our audience. Um, so on the slide, uh, actually, it'll be on the next slide if you don't mind advancing one more. Thank you. Uh, so we have some background information about Ottawa West Aging in Place um, that folks can read on the screen, but maybe you could just start by sharing a little bit about what Ottawa West Aging in Place is and how it supports the health and well-being of older adults. Absolutely. Uh, first, thank you for having me, Andrea. I really appreciate being here and being able to share uh, what I think is one of the best kept secrets in, in Ontario. So um, the aging in place model has been around for 15 years. Uh, we are um, a partnership with Ottawa Community Housing and uh, Community Support Services. So the former CCAC and Ottawa West doing community support services. And we provide uh, really integrated full circle of care support to people living in 11 Ottawa community housing locations across the city of Ottawa. These are all seniors only buildings. So everyone, um, at least one tenant in each of the buildings must be 55 years or older. And then they have a variety of, of health and social needs um, that make our services so critical. Um, and so how we really worked well as a partnership is by having those, uh, we have a, a storefront office in each of these locations with a, with either a social worker or a social service worker on site, providing uh, navigation and um, uh, resource uh, sharing for the, the individuals in the building. And then as you can see on the slide, I won't go into all the details, but we offer a variety of different um, services and products that help them to be able to live independently. And so, you know, it's interesting to see your original slides uh, talking about reducing the use of emergency rooms, delaying the onset of long-term care, et cetera, et cetera. We, we actually tick all of those boxes. Um, and really the, the, uh, where this, the impetus for this 15 years ago uh, was that there was a, a lot of emergency room use in these, these buildings. Um, and people were going to long-term care way before they needed to, often because they couldn't afford other supports that they needed in the home. Um, so one of the nice things about this service is that all of these services are offered free of charge for the people living in the buildings. Um, and we are non-discriminatory in that as long as you live at that address, you have access to these supports, um, which really do help you stay living independently longer. Thanks for that overview, Jennifer. We have had the privilege at ATC of seeing the program in place uh, it live in 3D and we're so impressed. And I think, you know, what really struck us the most was, um, you know, the relationship um, that the coordinators had and their ability to provide meaningful navigation. And that's one of our program principles, you know, sort of on the top three boxes of what programs are offering that seems to be um, having impact is really around that navigation piece. I'm wondering if you can tell us a little bit more about the way that you provide navigation and coordination services and the impact of this on the owner auto. Well, as as everyone knows, I'm sure on this call, I'm I'm certain I'm speaking to the converted. Our system in Canada is complicated. Um, it's kind of been layered on upon layer upon layer, and it's very, very hard to navigate. And that's um, our health system, our social service system, 
and just even things like navigating CRA or, or Service Canada, um, many, not many, a number of the people that are living in our buildings are not um, uh, originally Canadian. So they're first generation Canadian. They've come over either either as a, um, they're either permanent residents or, or new Canadians. So they don't really understand how to navigate the different systems. Having somebody there in a trusted relationship to really kind of take that temperature down, get rid of the stress and help them to be able to access different services, be it what's the food bank closest and how do I access it? I need to call CRA because I'm going to, my rent's gonna go up because I haven't done my taxes this year. How do I do that? All of these pieces um, really cause a lot of mental anguish for individuals and just having somebody there that they can reach out to who knows what they're doing and can help makes all the difference between um, people's social well-being and uh, and and being able to access and, and have the services that they need. Thank you for that. You know, what comes to mind is is the element of trust. And I think, you know, for a lot of a lot of people, having somebody who's knowledgeable and that they can trust to help guide them through health and social services and getting access to what they need is so important. And it's what we're seeing, you know, across so many amazing programs like yours in Canada. Um, your program's been around for a little bit longer than some of the others that we've engaged with recently. And so I'm curious, you know, with respect to our program principles of being adaptive and responsive, you know, I think you probably had the most experience in having to adapt and respond to changing needs over time. And wondering if you could share an example or some examples of how your program uh, is adaptive and responsive as, as the climate changes and people's needs change. Mm -hmm. I, I think that's one of the, the, the beauties of the program. First, I, I just want to touch on what you said around trust and relationship building. It is fundamental and paramount for the success of the program. And that even goes into the idea of being adaptive and responsive. Uh, we get to know the individuals in the building. They become uh, part of our um, infrastructure and, and how we operate and, and we're there to support them. And so the needs from somebody in the East end of Ottawa could very well be different than somebody in the South end. You know, in the East end, we have a lot of uh, Francophone clients and their needs are different than the South end where we may have a lot of Arabic speaking clients who are new Canadians and their needs are very different. Um, and so we, even within the program, uh, adapt and and innovate um, and provide the services that are very tailored to the individual uh, with some generalities around the buildings themselves. So there's there's kind of themes that come out in the different locations. But because we're able to um, tailor it to meet their needs, we're always iterating and changing over time. Uh, and really our, our goal, and, and at the end of the day, we really have three main goals. One is to reduce that emergency room use. One is to delay the onset of long-term care. And the other one is just to make sure that they have that social well-being and uh, connection with their community. And that really looks different depending on the location and the needs of the individuals. The other thing we've seen is over the 15 years we've been in this program, the um, number of seniors that have aged uh, has gone up exponentially, right? So we've always been in seniors buildings, but seniors 60 to 70. Now it's not abnormal that we're having birthday parties for 100 year olds. That was unheard of 15 years ago. They were in the long term care if, if they were still alive at all. And so we are definitely seeing an aging of the demographics, which has increased social needs and increased health needs um, for the individuals in that program. So really, I mean, I attribute to your success as a program, the fact that you know, the demographic is aging with and in your program. It's it's exactly. beautiful, but then obviously the needs have to, they change accordingly. And so um, just huge congratulations to you and the amazing work that you and your team is doing uh, on the ground every day. And just wanting to share how much of an inspiration it's been for us as we uh, embarked on designing a program um, that would be flexible enough to allow um folks to build programs that address both health and social needs in a way um, that is specific to the unique needs of every community. And I think you've done that so beautifully. So thank you for providing inspiration and a little bit of, of knowledge. And I hope um, 
that you'll come back and join us again in our Promising Practice webinar series that we plan to start in the new year. Um, so folks can really get a deep dive and you can share mm -hmm. a lot more about the nuts and the bolts because I see some questions in the chat. Um, folks are interested in knowing more. And so we will absolutely connect them uh, with you that way. And also just a plug for the um, Promising Practices case study series um, that is on our website and on our website will be featured in that very soon. So thank you very much, Jennifer. Appreciate your time today. Thanks so much, Andrea. And at this time, I'd like to continue on our little inspirational journey and call Ricardo Angelis to uh, to the camera. Hello. Hi, Andrea. Hi, Rick. Nice to see you. Nice thanks to meet for, you. Thanks for being here and sharing, uh, sharing your program with us. So in the same vein, we'll just kind of keep this conversational. Um, and I would love for you to introduce the audience to the CP at Clinic and CP at Home program. Um, the slide is up that kind of provides the, the formal information, but if you wouldn't mind just giving us a little, a little whirlwind tour of the program that we Sure, sure. So the CP at Clinic and CP at Home programs um, is a very well studied and very well evaluated program. We have multiple publications regarding the results of our pro or of our research uh, in developing this program. Uh, the program is uh, implemented by paramedic services in collaboration with local housing services and also our team who developed the program. The CP at clinic program specifically serves low income older adults living in social housing buildings. Um, based, and based on our research, these groups are of older adults are have poor health, and are socially isolated, have poor access to health care, have low health literacy, and they have high transfers uh, and admissions to long-term care. Uh, also, these in these buildings, people who are, live in this building have high rates of use for uh, or calls for 911. So through the CP at uh, clinic program, older adults are assessed and their health-related risk factors and social determinants of health um, are assessed, all these informations are entered to our smart database that has uh, built-in algorithms to provide assessment results and recommendations for referrals to local health services. And also community paramedics, based on the results, refer the uh, participants or patients to the community resources or healthcare uh, services um, that are available locally to help the patients improve their health and also their quality of life. So consistently, our studies have uh, shown that uh, CPET clinic reduces 911 calls, improves the health of the participants, and our most recent analysis showed that it actually decreased uh, transfers to long-term care homes. So the CP at home program is similar to CP at clinic program, except that it is delivered in the patient's home. Uh, and the participants are for CP at home are those who frequently call 911, and recently, the paramedic services are using is using the CP at home program for their uh, for the patients who are awaiting long term care. So it's their long term care wait list program. Thanks, Rick. That's a great overview. Um, you know, I, I love how different this is from our last example. You know, where we're working, both are working in social housing, um, but one with a you know a navigator sort of planted in the building, and another one leveraging community paramedicine resources coming in. Something that stands out to us as a key feature of your program is that how you've used that combination of community paramedic services and then evidence-based decision support um, mm -hmm. through that SMART database. And can you tell us a little bit more about how these elements work together to support your program? Um, so the, the, the CPF clinic programs um, provides a comprehensive assessment. So we use evidence-based tools that is incorporated into our SMART database and the database based on the information of the patients that's entered into it identifies the risk factors so that the community paramedics knows which risk factors are uh, is in the, in the patients that they're seeing and also provide appropriate support to the patients. And the list of locally available resources are also built in into the database. Uh, these supports are not limited to healthcare services. It can be social services, and in some cases, even ways to obtain home supports, like um, and devices. Like some of them provide help the patients uh, 
obtain walkers or wheelchairs and uh, and which patients have access to but have no idea as to how to navigate the system. So these services improve the health of the patients, their quality of life, and also help them stay healthier and longer at home. Thank you for that. I, I, I'm i going to take a risk here and go a little bit sort of off script um, because I think I think something that our audience is going to want to know that we might not have uh, have talked about before is if they if they're watching and they're a paramedicine program somewhere else in the country and they wanted to do something as sophisticated as this and leverage the tools that you've already developed in the databases. Um, is there a way for people to replicate what you're doing? Is there a way to um, to spread what you're doing easily? Um, in terms of our program, it's an out of the box program. So we already have like core elements. So based on our study, we have, uh, we have stated that there are certain core elements of the program that needs to be in place so that it would be effective, but there are a lot of flexible elements. So, um, it is, it is simple enough that it can be adapted in, um, in many different locations. So we have implemented it in, or the paramedics, are actually implementing it in different populations. They have implemented it with new immigrants. They have implemented it with the homeless populations. Um, we have even adapted, like uh, right now, we're recently adapting it to non-paramedics to implement the program. So it is easy enough to be adaptable to different situations. But the important thing is that the core elements of the program is being is implemented. Otherwise, we cannot vouch that it will have the same effectiveness as what we have what we have had in our previous studies. Yeah, exactly. And that's where I was sort of hoping that you would go with this because my understanding is that um, you know you've done so much work to build a strong foundation and to evaluate, um, and that you've already done some work to support teams um, in implementing this outside of the original pilot. Um, mm -hmm. program. And so, you know, wanting to inspire folks that if this is something that you're interested in, in or you want to just learn more about how to um, utilize paramedicine resources to support aging in place, there's a lot that you can um, utilize that already exists in this program, um, as you were just saying, but it's very customizable um, to, mm -hmm. you know, contacts. And so, you know, really grateful um, for you to come and share this promising practice because I think it, it represents um, something that is ripe and ready and can be shared um, and implemented and have the same impact that you're having elsewhere. Um, so thank you so much yeah. uh, for sharing this. We do have you written up already as a promising practice. It's on our website, it's already live. Um, was there anything else that you wanted to share before we sign off? Yes, I think I, one thing, one other thing that I wanted to share is that we also have a training program for implementation of the program. So as part of the out of the box program that we provide, we also have the training modules so that whoever will implement the program, uh, in general, it's for paramedics, but it can be implemented by other um, implementers, they can undergo the, the program so that they can implement it as intended. That is wonderful and very rare to find in uh, in out of the box promising practices that it also has that that training and education component as well as you know measurement and evaluation. So thank you once again for uh, for being with us today and for sharing not just online but in the promising practice. And again, for those who are interested in learning even more about CP at clinic, um, we hope that you. Can Yeah. Just letting know that we've lost your sound. So you may need to readjust your oh. microphone. All right. Doing a quick test here. Has the sound connected? Testing, testing. That's better. Ah, wonderful. Great. All right. Thank you for letting me know. Um, so this is the end of our formal content. Uh, we will move to questions and answers momentarily. Um, 
but just wanted to uh, provide some wrap up information to ensure that we don't uh, forget to share these details before we get deep into questions. Um, so first of all, this webinar will be posted on HEC's website and everyone who has registered will be notified when it's available online. Uh, secondly, um, the applications, if you're interested in applying, should all be submitted by email. And the email address is on this slide, but of course, once you open the application materials, you'll find all the details of how to apply um, in those as well. If you have any questions um, that are not answered today, please reach out to us uh, at the email address on the slide. We are happy to respond to any comments, questions, requests, um, as well, uh, all of the answers to today's questions, including those that were submitted, but we might not have time to get to uh, in the live part of the presentation, we will send the answers out to all the registrants, uh, along with the link to the slide deck. Um, and also a reminder that all applicants, whether you're successful or not, uh, will be invited to join our Enabling Aging in Place community of practice. Um, so people who are in our community of practice will receive invitations to our public webinars, to some of our knowledge exchange activities, um, we'll share resources that we come across or that we develop um, through the program. So just by applying, um, you will have the option of opting in or out of that community of practice. But if you choose not to apply, if you're here today and you're just learning about this and you're not quite ready to submit an application and you want to be part of the community of practice, you absolutely can. Um, you can send an email to the address on the screen and we will be happy to add you to our list. Um, so with that, I am going to open up the floor for questions, starting with, apologies, I'm just going to open up our Q&A document here. Tanya, could you do me the favor of reading out the first question and then I'll continue on once I'm able to get our Q&A page up. Sure. Um, so one of the first questions that we received early on in the presentation was res respect to um, uh, limits on how many applications will be approved. Ah, thank you. So as part of the application process. So 25 applications will receive approval and funding in phase one. Um, the hope is that all of those 25 teams um, will complete the implementation and evaluation plans uh, and progress on to phase two. Um, however, if not all 25 teams progress on to phase two, then there's the potential for new teams to come on in phase two. And that application process is still to be determined. Another question that we received was around whether or not OHT, so Ontario Health Teams, uh, are eligible to apply for this funding initiative. Absolutely, OHTs can apply. Uh, we know of some fantastic work happening in the OHT community, Ontario, with respect to aging in place and very much welcome uh, the participation and application of those teams. And now I'm able to see the chat, uh, the, the questions. Um, and so there's a question here for Ricardo, which is if professional healthcare services are required, like occupational therapy or physiotherapy, who does the CPA clinic team partner with to provide those professionals who go into the homes? So, Ricardo, do you mind just coming on to help answer that? Yeah, um, so it depends on the um, location. So. For example, um, in our um, and and, and uh, the paramedic services generate the resources that are available in the community. So for some of them, for example, for um, one of the regions, they have they are in contact with um, the public health services. Some of them are in contact with the um, uh, the, the there are specific housing services that it, it, it's really, I cannot uh, say in general because it really is specific by the municipality and by the region and what resources are available. I can only, I, I don't wanna mention the specific regions, but I do know like some of them have specific resources that is in connection with their uh, public health region. So that, that as I mentioned, it's very variable. So it, um, it's not something that is 
applicable to all the regions. Thanks, Rick. And that's consistent with a lot of what we're seeing in Aging in Place programming is that it's about local partnerships. Yes. And in developing those with health and social organizations um, in each local community. And that's something that our program is committed to supporting is helping organizations to build those local partnerships. Um, and that's part of what our asset-based community development approach um, that we're going to be promoting in this program will help folks do is to really understand those local assets, um, including, you know, um, allied health professionals and, and people that can come into the program. So just an example of, the, you know, the fact that it really does, you know, take a lot of um, energy to invest locally in order to develop a solution that that meets the needs of the community. Yeah. And initially in our program, when we started a way back, it was the CCAC that ah. helped us <laughs> provide those services. But yeah, it has evolved recently. So each region now have their, their different partners. Yeah. Makes complete sense. Thanks so much for that. And I'll, uh, I'll be sure to call you back on if, uh, if we've got some more questions for you. Um, we have another question here, which is what does the support look like from HEC for approved applications in the different phases? Um, so we talked about the financial support. So in phase one, it was up to 15,000 and in phase two, it was up to 25,000. Um, but consistent across both phases will be coaching. So we will be um, bringing on experts um, who will help folks with their implementation and evaluation planning activities that will experts in asset-based community development, experts in equity, diversity, and inclusion, um, and folks who know a lot about um, implementation planning and continuous quality improvement. And so depending on the unique needs of each team um, and the resources that they um, that they need, you know, to help achieve their program goals, we'll connect folks um, with the most appropriate resources and support for that, um, as well as uh, conducting workshops. We've got plans for an in-person workshop in phase one, um, which will um, provide teams the opportunity to come together in person, to get to know each other, to get to know each other's work, to share um, you know, elements that contribute to success, to talk about challenges, um, and also to learn together as a group with respect to some of those foundational activities. Um, so those are some of the primary ways um, that we provide webinars and you know, knowledge sharing um, of information as we're collecting it as we go. Um, the next question had to do with dates, and we talked about October 17th, so that was our launch date, um, that was the start of applications, so we, we just launched um, last week, and we are accepting applications until uh, November the 15th, and I noticed that there's some problems with the audio again, I'm hoping that if I hold the mic like this, it gets a little bit better. Um, and so, yes, we're just, you, you haven't missed anything. This has only been open for a week. Um, the next question I see is, what was the specific promising practice that was funded through the collaborative for Ottawa West Aging in place? Um, so the promising practice was is, is actually called Ottawa West Aging in place. It's a social housing based um, promising practice that integrates um, you know, navigation and coordination services directly into the buildings. Um, and you'll have an opportunity to learn more again um, when you visit our website and you can review the promising practice that will be published very soon. So thank you for that question. Um, the next I see a question about is the idea that organizations utilize the initial funding to develop long-term relations with the Provincial Ministry of Health to continue to support the long-term operating costs. That is certainly one way that, um, that the funding can be used. It, it will be very different program to program. So the idea is by the end of phase one, that teams have a plan in place for how they're going to implement. Um, and they have a plan in place for how they're going to evaluate their programs. Um, and so if, you know, if that planning requires um, building connections with ministries of health um, or other local organizations. You know, certainly the funding can be used to support that. 
just pointing out that teams are expected um, to have the resources in place to do this work and to implement this work in order to apply. You know, we recognize that the financial contribution of, of the program is not enough to run a program. And so the expectation is, is that folks coming in will have funding for their programs and we will provide the support um, that will help to promote the sustainability, the quality, um, and um, ensuring that these programs you know, are successful in their goals. Um, of supporting aging in place. Um, there was a question, I think yeah, I've answered this one earlier about Ontario health teams, absolutely. We will welcome them. Um, and I'll just pause here for a second because I don't have any other specific questions that are coming in through this document. I'm just kind of creating a little bit of open space here. Um, if folks are taking time to formulate some questions. Oh, good question. What will be non-fundable items? Um, if you go to the application form, there is uh, a list of uh, eligible expenses in the budget index. Um, and so rather than listing them all out here, because um, I'm afraid if I do it by memory, or um, so I'm just going to point you um, point you to the appendix in the application form of the budget, and that will show all, um, all uh, eligible and ineligible expenses. I'll just wait if there are any last minute questions before we sign off. So just a reminder that we will share the link to the recording um, as well as the answers to all the questions that were asked today and any others that we received by email. And um, the result, ah, actually that's a great question. The results of the applications will be shared um, in December. So it should be uh, early to mid-December that we will be responding to all the applicants about the status um, of their, their funding. Well, and something else that perhaps I can uh, mention in relationship to that is that, uh, so the funding decisions will be announced in December. The idea is that teams will get started right away in January. Um, and so in order for that to happen, um, the agreements with each team will need to be formalized. Um, and so we've, we've published along with the application, a sample of that um, agreement template so that organizations can review it in advance uh, and have that signed by the 5th of January um, if they are ready to commit to the program. Uh, there's a question as to whether we are available for individual consent, consult to discuss proposed ideas. Um, yes, please send an email if you have something that you're not sure about um, in terms of its eligibility or you want to discuss, um, you know, possibilities with respect to the program. We will respond um, to those requests and, uh, and set up a time to chat um, if that's uh, what's required to, uh, to support the application process. Um, teams in phase one, question as to whether they'll be eligible to participate in phase two. Absolutely. The intention is for teams to participate in phase one and phase two. We want to support the planning. We want to support the implementation. Um, and so the expectation is that you will stay engaged in both, um, provided you're able to complete um, the requirements for phase two, which is the completed uh, implementation uh, and evaluation plans. Just looking to see if there's any other new questions. I think we've answered the last few that have just come in through the chat. Thank you for posting uh, the email address in the chat.
And I think that's sort of the, the main takeaway is that if there's if you have a question, if there's anything you're not sure about, if you want to apply, but you're not sure if you're eligible, you know, please reach out to us. We are here. We want to make this application process as accessible as possible. We want to include as many diverse communities, folks who don't typically apply, um, but can do some amazing things um, with a little bit of support. We really want to reach you. Um, so by all means, don't be shy. Um, we're happy to, to support the best that we can um, to help teams to connect with this program. Not seeing any other questions. Thanks again for posting uh, the contact information. Um, with that, I think we will we will sign off and continue to receive questions by email, and we will be in touch um, with the webinar recording and details. Um, there's a poll that's just popped up on the screen. I urge you, please, if you don't mind taking 30 seconds um, to to fill out this poll. It really helps us understand um, how. Uh, how our, our audience is receiving what we're offering. Um, and it's important for us to measure, uh, measure our own impact. So thank you for taking a second to do that. And thanks again for all of your, uh, your questions, for your kind attention to our guest speakers, uh, Jennifer and Rick. Appreciate you coming to inspire us with your amazing programs um, and wishing you all a wonderful day.